Church, it is great to be with you, all of you joining us in person here on our campus, all of you joining us online, out in digital world, spread all over the place. We're honored you're with us today. Hey, we're gonna jump right into it today. We're gonna be in Mark chapter 14. So if you have your Bible, you can open up to Mark chapter 14. If you have your digital Bible on your phone, by the way, that's an okay thing to do is to have the Bible on your phone. And it's okay to use your phone in service to take notes and that. Um, if you don't have a digital Bible on your phone, I actually encourage you. Uh, the YouVersion Bible app is a great one. Uh, Bible Gateway is another great Bible app. And that way, I mean, most of us have our phones most places we go, and that way you take the Bible with you pretty much most places you go. If you want a paper copy of the Bible and uh, you don't have one, that one in the seat back in front of you, that's yours. That's our gift to you. You can take that with you. Uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Thanksgiving. That's yours to keep. Uh, but we're going to jump right into Mark chapter 14. Now, we're in the last moments of Jesus' life. Jesus is back in Jerusalem with his buddies. They have celebrated what would end up being their final dinner together. They went out to the garden to pray. And there in the garden, Jesus was betrayed by one of his buddies, Judas. Judas sold him out. And then Jesus is arrested. And after he's rested, they took Jesus to the high priest's home where the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of religious law had gathered. Meanwhile, Peter followed him at a distance and went right into the high priest's courtyard. That's a pretty brave thing to do. That's entering the lion's lair, if you will. Well, there he sat with the guards, warming himself by the fire. That sounds kind of nice this time of year, just warming by the fire. Well, inside, the leading priests and the entire high council were trying to find evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. Listen, they already determined what they wanted to do with Jesus, what they wanted to do to Jesus. Now they're just trying to find evidence to legitimize that. They had already made up their minds, let's kill him. Now they gotta say, well, do we have enough evidence? Is it legit for us to do that? So their minds are already made up, but they couldn't find any evidence. So many false witnesses spoke against Jesus, but they contradicted each other because they were false witnesses. Their lies proved to be lies. Finally, some men stood up and gave this false testimony. Again, false testimony, another lie. They said, we heard Jesus say, I'll destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I'll build another made without human hands. But that's not exactly what Jesus said. And people knew that's not exactly what he said. So even then, they didn't get their stories straight. You know, when you tell a lie, you gotta remember every detail of the lie. But when you tell the truth, all you gotta do is remember what really happened. So the high priest stood up before the others. He asked Jesus, aren't you gonna answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus remained silent and he made no reply. Then the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? In a sense, asking him, are you God? And to that, Jesus said, I am. Now, this little phrase right here, these two words, I am. When we say that in English, it doesn't mean a whole lot. I, Dr. Seuss made that pretty famous. Sam, I am, I am, Sam. I mean, that's not a big deal, right? We say I am in our culture all the time. So we lose a little bit in the translation from the Greek to the English with this. Because in the original language the Bible was written in, in the language that Jesus spoke, the Greek, this statement carries a whole lot of weight. Because the Greeks would not have said it the way Jesus said it. If you were to say, hey, is it, who are you? you know, are you John? Hey, yeah, that's who I am. They would not say it that way. Because this harkens all the way back to when Moses was at the burning bush and God said, hey, Mo, go back to Egypt and tell the Pharaoh to let my people go. And Mo's like, that's great. Who do I say sent me? Because if I say, hey, I heard a voice from a bush that was on fire, nobody's going with that one. <laughs> so God says, tell them I am. Now, that's a complex statement, and it brings a whole lot of weight, and that's for a separate sermon. But the essence of that is this weighty statement of God saying, you want to know who I am? I am who I am. And so when Jesus says, I am, he says, I am God. That's, that's how we should hear that. And then he quotes some prophets about himself. He said, you'll see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. 
Well, at that, the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror. That that's something that the high priest would do when somebody spoke against God, when they made an outlandish statement and blasphemed God. And blasphemy is to go against God. And the priest would tear his clothing to show displeasure and to show grief and to say, this is so wrong. So he tears his clothing and says, no, you shouldn't have said that. And he looks, he says, why do we need another witness? We have all heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they all cried. He deserves to die. Speaking of Jesus, after a mock trial. Well, then some of them began to spit at him. They blindfolded him and began hitting him with their fists. Prophesy to us. What was happening was they blindfolded him and then they took turns hitting him and when they said prophesy, they're saying, tell us which one of us just hit you. If you really are God, you would know which one of us just, just took the jab, which one of us just took the hit. And then the guards slapped him as they took him away. That's pretty brutal. You know, these men had made up accusations because they had already made up their minds. So here Jesus is on trial, and while they are accusing Jesus and falsely accusing him, did you catch what his strategy was? Silence. Jesus stayed silent. Silence was his strategy, and why? Because he knew he was not getting a fair trial. He knew their minds were already made up. He knew these guys were worked up and they were unreasonable. They had made up their minds and so now they were making up the accusations. And Jesus refused to bite the bait. They were dangling the bait right out there in front of him. And Jesus knew once you bite the bait, you're hooked and then you're just stuck in that argument. But he knew that those empty accusations and those meaningless confrontations we're not worth his breath. And so he did not want to entertain that ongoing conversation. But then when the high priest finally asked a legitimate question, he said, are you the Messiah? Are you God? Are you the chosen one, the rescuer, the redeemer? Are you the Christ? Are you the one? Jesus said, you bet, man. That's exactly who I am. And he broke his silence at that point, responding calmly, I am. And the other guys, Jesus was calm and they lost it and they went over the edge and they said, kill him, kill him. Jesus was not going to get a fair trial. Jesus was being mocked in the kangaroo court. And so he knew, respond with silence until it's the right time. Friend, with the holidays right around the corner, many of us, most of us are probably going to find ourselves in interactions and gatherings with family and friends, with coworkers and neighbors. And some of y'all, many of y'all are gonna find yourselves interacting with some people who are a little less pleasant to interact with. Anybody might have that. Um, and so, you know, this time of year, the holiday gatherings, you see those people who you seldom see any other time of year. You're suddenly face to face with them. You're suddenly dealing with these people. Maybe it's the family member who you see once every few years and you suddenly see them, but then they're all up in your business and they're asking all the questions. Maybe it's the people you see regularly and you're just dreading, like we see this person too much as it is. And they're the obnoxious one who gets right up in your face. Some of you are going to feel like you're on trial. Anybody ever been there? You feel like you're on trial during the holidays. You have that perfectionist person that you gotta deal with, the one who's always critiquing everything you do. They're critiquing your outfit and what you wore. They're critiquing, oh, you don't own an eye. Iron. That's unfortunate. They're critiquing those things, right? They're critiquing the food you made. They're critiquing the gift you brought or the one you didn't bring. They're critiquing your home if you're the one hosting. And they've got all the things. And they're making you look bad so they can make themselves look better. And you feel like you're on trial the whole time. Anybody know that person? Anybody? Yeah. Any of you are that person? I'm just kidding. Some of you are like, ooh, I'm next to that person. But don't say that. Don't say that, right? Right? 
Some of you, you're going to deal with a political analyst, uh, maybe analyst is the wrong word, the political antagonist, the one who has all the answers to all the problems in the world, and they trace it all back to the other side, right? Those, those liberal social Democrats, those righteous alt-right Republicans, right? they're, they're going to choose one of those sides, and they're going to go after it, and they've got all the responses, and they're just trying to bait you into a fight. They know you don't agree, or maybe you do agree, but you don't agree enough, and, and you're an idiot if you don't agree with everything they say, because they know all the issues, and it's all the other side's fault, and they're just going to get that motor going, right? They're going to try and get you into the political fight, right? They toss out all the things that would stir things up. Maybe you've got the storyteller who tells the dirt on everyone else, and maybe they bring up the dirt on you. They tell the story. They don't even get the details right, but they get the laughs at your expense, and you feel like, right, they've, they've shared your, your most embarrassing moment or they've shared your worst mistake. And you feel like you have to defend yourself. That's not really the way it happened or that was so long ago and I'm not that person anymore. And you feel like you're on trial. Maybe you deal with that obnoxious one who's had way more than one too many and they're saying all the obnoxious statements and they're telling all the obnoxious stories and all the bad jokes and all the things you don't want your kids to hear and you feel like you gotta defend your kids from that because on the way home, you're gonna have to answer your kids with, well, what do all these words mean? <laughs> Some of you have that person. Maybe, maybe you've got the investigator or perhaps we can more accurately label the interrogator. The person who's always asking about your spending and your job, your income, your lifestyle, your car, your house, your clothing, your vacations, your retirement, your savings, always asking about your marriage, always asking about your kids, and always willing to offer their better advice on how you should do all of it. Oh, you spent too much on that. You should have gotten this car. Said, oh, you didn't look at consumer reports. Oh, you should do this. Oh, this is how you need to take care of that. Oh, your marriage would be better. Your kids would really be doing better. Your kids would be more like my kids, if only you, right? And what's really sad is sometimes we are those people. I won't ask for a show of hands, but we have all slid into that spot once or twice with some questions we ask. You know, oftentimes, some really well-intentioned questions come from really good people, people who love God and who actually love you. The problem is they're just well-intentioned dragons. <laughs> they end up meaning well, but accidentally putting you on trial, maybe making some assumptions, maybe making some statements that cause you to have to defend yourself. You know, questions that we sometimes ask, church, that were maybe not meaning any harm, but they can do great harm. I think of gatherings this time of year, you ask the young single person, when are you gonna get married? When are you gonna find Mr. Wright, Mrs. Wright? You ask the young couple, when are you guys gonna have kids? But you don't know that behind the scenes that young couple without kids has some dysfunction in their relationship and they're wise enough that they've spotted it and they're wise enough they're seeking help for it. They just don't wanna broadcast it for everybody else and they know, they're wise enough to know, hey, if we just add a child to this mix, that won't fix the problem. Listen, if you're in that zone, kids don't fix the problems, they amplify them. In fact, once you have kids, you'll discover problems you did not know you had before kids. Kids are great, but they do that. They surface all kinds of stuff and so maybe this young couple says, you know, we're not ready. And they're wise to know that. Or maybe, maybe that couple gives some bogus answer, some fake response to hide all the pain and the hurt that's just under the surface because of their infertility. And so they leave there that night and they weep when they get home. They might weep before they even leave the driveway because once again, they're facing all the feels that come with that. And I just, I just want to speak to that real quick. If you are that couple, don't buy the lie of Satan. Don't buy the lie of the enemy that says you are somehow lesser of a human, lesser of a man or a woman, a husband, a wife, lesser of a parent because you're wrestling with conceiving. That's just not true. Your value and your worth is not wrapped up in your ability to conceive. Your value and your worth is determined by the fact that there's a God who created you and made you and loved you. And your infertility is the part of the 
just the pain of living in a broken world. But your value, your worth is not determined by that. So don't listen to those lies. And I just want to offer an apology to all the single people as well. On behalf of the entirety of Western culture, you are not less than. But like the Western world has just so idolized sex. And the Western church, the American church, has so idolized family. And when you have these two idols of sex and family and sex and marriage that are put on these pedestals, that somehow being single becomes like a dysfunction or a problem. When in fact, Scripture says that while being married and being a parent is a beautiful gift, the greater gift, the higher calling is singleness. That's actually what God's word teaches, is that singleness is the greater gift. And so that means if you're a single person, you're not playing on the JV team. You're not in the minors or the little leagues because you're waiting for Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright to come along. In fact, some of you, you might not be waiting for that person at all. You may be content in your celibate singleness. And we should celebrate that and champion that for you, not as a lesser thing, but as a greater thing. Scripture says that's a greater kingdom service, that you are unhindered by the responsibilities and the worries and the weight. This makes it sound like being married is a bad thing. (laughs) It's not. It's a beautiful thing. But there is responsibility and worry and weight that comes with being married, that comes with being a parent. And to be single is to not have that. You're actually freed up for kingdom service. And can we just acknowledge that if you are single, you stand in really good company of some biblical giants, people like Jesus. Like we just stop the list right there, right? Like if singleness is a problem, then we've got an issue with Jesus. And I don't think we do. I don't think that's the problem. But the list even goes beyond that. I mean, you got Dinah and Anna and Joseph, Apostle Paul, John the Baptist, Naomi, Mary, Martha, Elijah, Elisha, Jeremiah, Daniel. The list could go on for quite some time. You stand among some really stellar people in biblical history if you're single. That's not a bad thing. In fact, the Apostle Paul, when writing to the church at Corinth, said this. He said, I wish everyone were single just as I am. Yet, each person has a special what? Say it with me, a special gift from God of one kind or another. You know what he's saying? He says singleness is a gift. It's a gift from God. Now, is marriage a gift? Is parenting a gift? Are children a gift? Yes, for sure. A beautiful blessing. Most days. (laughs) Most days. That's my wife. She'll say most days it's a gift. But according to Paul in his letter, singleness is the greater gift. He said, I wish you were freed up to be single, but some of you, you just aren't strong enough. Your self-control, it's lacking, and you will burn with passion. And so you should get married so you don't sin otherwise. But if you are able to restrain, choose singleness because you can serve God even greater. Wow. I think we've missed that message somewhere along the lines. But church, we need to hear it, and we need to be careful not to make the single people or the childless couples in our midst feel like they're on trial and somehow they need to defend themselves against our expectations or our beliefs from our culture of what's right. Paul says, some of you just aren't strong enough to be single, but if you are, pursue God. Because when you honor your singleness to God, with celibate singleness for the glory of God, God can do some incredible things with that. Now, if you are single and you wish you weren't, that's okay too. And by the way, it's way better to be single and wish you weren't than to be married and wish you were single. I'm just, I'm just gonna toss that one out there. Single and wish you are married is a better spot to be than married wishing you were single, but, right? But if that's you, you're single and you wish to be married, that's okay. Pursue that. Do what you need to do to become the person you want to marry, right? To, like, to, to be up at that status. But do this. Don't squander your season of singleness. Instead, surrender it to God and steward it well for his glory and the good of his church. And I think through that, you will find tremendous blessing. And who knows what might come of that. Now, there's another area of being interrogated and 
being on trial that I wanna address for most of us. You know, this time of year, we'll start inviting people to Christmas. In fact, Mark will mention this a little bit later, but we have some resources to help you do that. Little Christmas invites that say when the, the dates of our Christmas services are this year on the 23rd and the 24th. And, and we encourage you, there are gonna be some of these available after service to grab them and, and share them with family who are close by, even family who are far from us and they can watch the services online. I invite your friends, invite your neighbors, coworkers, invite the, the, the people who serve you at restaurants and wherever you go. But you know, sometimes when we do something like that, we're well intentioned, we invite somebody to join us at a Christmas service, sometimes the reaction is different. Now most people are gentle and grateful and in fact, research shows that most people when invited to something like that will say yes. And it's way more than just 51%. It's actually like 70 some percent of the people, if you invite them to join you, they will say yes. So be bold and invite, be winsome and invite them. But just know that there are some people, we know that our faith is always under fire, right? It's always under the microscope. Sometimes it comes under fire. And, and so this time of year, you, you might feel like you have to defend your faith because there are those people who want to question. You might be dealing with a skeptic who has questions about everything and suddenly you feel like you have to defend your reason for being a Christian against every news story of Christians doing some boneheaded thing or any Christian throughout any time who has ever done something wrong. Oh, that pastor there. Or how about the Crusades of several hundred years ago? Yes, I was the one who orchestrated the Crusades. Let me tell you about it. Like, suddenly we feel like we gotta defend against all those things. And guess what? Are the problems in the church? Of course there are, because the church is made of people and all of us are messy and broken. Listen, when people talk about hypocrisy in the church, I'm like, yeah, that's kind of the point. <laughs> like, that's why we need Jesus. We don't come to church because we are better than everybody who doesn't. We come to church to get better off because of what our Savior has done for us. So you wanna complain about the hypocrisy of the church. There's hypocrisy everywhere. We just admit it. <laughs> we just know we are broken and messy and need a Savior. So that's the beauty of what Christ has done for us. Now, some of you though, you're gonna face the scoffer. And the scoffer is different than the skeptic. The skeptic has genuine questions and curiosity. They have doubts that they're trying to get answered. They have some disillusionment from the past. But the scoffer, the scoffer's picking a fight. The scoffer's like, bring it on, man. I'm gonna mock your faith. I'm gonna mock you. I'm gonna tear you down. Oh, your outdated, antiquated religion. Oh, this opiate for the masses. On, on and on and on and on they'll go. And they're just trying to pick a fight and trying to belittle you and make you feel lesser, make you feel like somehow you're the bigot or you're the antagonist or you're what's wrong with the world because you follow Jesus and they want to pick a fight. And some of us were wired in such a way that our natural reaction is to fight back. We just want to punch them in the throat. That makes for a really bad Thanksgiving. Don't do that. Don't, don't do any throat punching. Now, some of you, on the other hand, you think, well, maybe it'll just be easier if I just go dormant. If I kind of put my, my faith, if I put my Christianity in the closet and we just won't talk about it, I, I just won't even do anything, say anything. Like they don't, they don't even need to know I go to church. And I can, I can miss out on the issues. I can miss out on the problems if I just stay silent. We know while Jesus was being grilled by the religious leaders inside the high priest's home, at the same time, Peter was in the courtyard below. And one of the servant girls who worked for the high priest came by and noticed Peter warming himself at the fire. Again, it just sounds great this time of year. Well, she looked at Pete and she said, you're one of those guys with Jesus. To which Pete was like, no, I'm not. I don't even know what you're talking about. And he went out into the entryway and just then a rooster crowed, cock a doo doo and when the servant girl, so that's the best I got for you. When the servant girl saw him standing there, she began telling the others, this man is definitely one of them. But Peter denied it again. Well, a little later, some of the other bystanders confronted Pete and said, you must be one of them because you're a Galilean. Galileans had a distinct accent. His accent had given him away. It's just like there was somebody from Boston here and we knew there was an issue with Boston. We said, oh, we know you're one of them because you're one of the Bostonians. You talk about the comedy being popped over there real far away. So Peter swore a curse on himself. And now when it says he swore, that doesn't mean he cussed, okay? It means he swore an oath. He gave his word. He shared his testimony. He says, a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know this man Jesus you're talking about. And immediately, cock-a-doodle-doo, 
for the second time. And right then, Jesus' words flash through Pete's mind. Before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. And Pete was broken in soul and wept. But why did Peter deny? I mean, this is Pete. Like, he denies? I mean, this is Peter who had all the confidence to boldly step out of the boat and walk on water when everybody else sat there watching. This is Peter who confessed when Jesus asked, who do you say I am? Were you telling about all the other people saying who I am? Who do you say I am? And Pete confessed, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he confessed it at a time and in a place where he could have got himself thrown into prison for going against the Caesar, the king, for saying that. This is Peter who confidently proclaimed when Jesus said, all of you around the table are gonna abandon me, one of you is gonna betray me, and Pete says, no way, I'm never leaving you, I'm with you to the end. This is Peter who when they came to arrest Jesus, he confronted the soldiers, pulled out his sword, showed his terrible swordsmanship. The best he could do was lop off an ear. Like that's just, he wasn't swinging. But he was the confident confrontationalist who went after the soldiers coming after Jesus. But now, this same guy, Pete, is the coward in the courtyard? Like, whoa. Pete, why you deny? Because Peter knew Jesus' trial was not legitimate. It's a kangaroo court. It's a mock trial. They're going to crucify my friend. And what they do to Jesus, they might just do to me. Pete was gripped by fear. Now, the beautiful thing is his story doesn't end there. Later, he's restored by Jesus. He's commissioned by Jesus. He helps lead the church in the first century to the point where eventually he is crucified for his faith. Upside down, we're told. He said, I don't even deserve to die the same way my Savior did. But he's not there yet. Now, in this moment, he's still gripped by fear, and I think we can, we can identify with that. Because some of us, we, we face fear and we deny Jesus. We, we might not speak up when we should. We, we might not speak out when we should. We, we might kind of closet our faith at times because we're afraid of the antagonism that might come our way. I, I don't think many of us are generally afraid too often that we're gonna be flogged or beaten or spit upon or crucified, though it might feel that way inside. Maybe that the relationship will be torn or at least be awkward. What if they don't believe what I believe? What if they believe something different? What if I invite them and they say no? What if I share my story and they say that I'm an idiot? What, what if, right? And so we are afraid of those things. We're afraid that maybe we'll face questions that we don't have answers for. Maybe the skeptic's gonna ask something and we're, we're not sure if our faith will stand up under that? What if we're afraid of being lumped in with all those blaming and belittling and shaming and shouting Christians in that other guard, right? The, the ones on the news who don't, we don't want to be associated with them. Maybe we're just afraid that we won't live up to the holy standard before us. And maybe you are like Peter and you think, there's no way I'd deny Jesus. I would never deny Jesus. Be careful, friend, because your confidence is showing Are you denying Jesus on the regular? I mean, are there areas of your life that you have yet to surrender fully to Jesus and so you deny him in those areas? Maybe you deny Jesus in your sex or your sexuality or you deny him in your hobbies and in your fun, what you watch, what you listen to. Maybe you deny Jesus with your money, where you spend it, where you give it, what you do with it. You deny Jesus with your time and what you do with that. You deny Jesus with your relationships. Are there areas of your life that you have yet to surrender to Jesus? So Jesus, I'll give you all of this, but I'm keeping this one for me and I'm denying him there. Is that you? Is it possible that you're afraid that Jesus is going to ask too much from you, desire too much change in a certain area for you, that you're gonna have to give up something you've grown accustomed to, comfortable with, that you really like, and so you deny Jesus right there. You know, Peter's problem did not begin in the courtyard. But when Jesus was arrested, we see this. Peter followed him at a distance. At a distance. Friend, how closely do you follow Jesus? 
If we want Jesus to change us, if we want the hope that he offers us, if we want the life that he offers us, we've got to get in proximity to Jesus. That's why we've been spending an entire year in the pursuit of Jesus using this as a supplement, not as a replacement to the Bible. I know some people are like, oh, hold on, I don't need anything but the Bible. Well, this doesn't replace the Bible. This helps us navigate our way through it. Not that we just know about Jesus, but that we get close to him and know him as Lord, as friend, as Savior, as rescuer. If you don't yet have a copy of this, and maybe you're newer to us, or maybe you've just been reluctant for a while, we still have some left. I encourage you to stop by the Next Steps area as you leave here today. It's on the right in the lobby. I encourage you to pick one up for yourself, pick one up for a friend, maybe even get one as a gift this season. If it's been meaningful for you to go through it, maybe pick up one of those extra copies and say, hey, I think this would be good for you, and I'm willing to go back and do this with you in the coming year. See, that's why we've done this, is to get in close proximity to our Savior. And, and Maybe you're not there. Maybe you're following at a distance. Maybe you're still new on this journey. And so you start at a distance. Most of us do. That's where we start is at a distance to Jesus. And that's an okay place to start. It's a terrible place to stay because if we stay distant from Jesus, eventually we will deny him. Eventually we will deny his power and his presence in our lives. We have to get in close proximity to Jesus. And friend, let me tell you, the further you stand from him, the the more distance you have between you and Jesus, the easier it is to think you guys look alike. Like, ah, I I look a lot like Jesus in my life. But after 30 years of following him, what I've realized is the closer I get to Jesus, the less I look like him. In fact, the closer I get to Jesus, I realize, man, I still don't look enough like him at all. And I got a lot of growing to do. And that's why we pursue Jesus. Jesus because it's only in close proximity to him that he brings change in our lives. When Peter was asked about his faith, he denied it. When Pete was asked about Jesus, say, you're with him, he said, I don't even know who he is. But when Jesus was asked about his own identity, if he's the Messiah, he said, that's exactly who I am. The same question that prompted Pete to go silent was the question that prompted Jesus to break his silence, prompted Jesus to speak up. So friend, let me offer just a few suggestions for us on how to deal with difficult situations and people that we might deal with during this season. You know, the first one is don't try to reason with the unreasonable people. There are going to be unreasonable people. What was Jesus' strategy? He stayed silent. He said, it's not worth my breath, not worth wasting my time to get into the empty accusations and the meaningless confrontations. When you bite the bait, you're hooked and you're stuck. He said, I'm just going to avoid that. Now, I've been in some situations with some very dysfunctional like family at times, holiday gatherings that have been troubling People who belittle and nag, who are overbearing and antagonizing, disruptive, disrespectful, who guilt others. And if you find yourself dealing with those kinds of people, some of those people, it's okay. In fact, it is very wise to create healthy boundaries for yourself, to say they're just some topics, we're not going to go there. We're not going to talk politics at dinner. We're not going to do this when we gather for things. We're not going to talk about that issue or that time or that person. We're not going to talk about this first beyond the back. Maybe you just create some healthy boundaries. And you might need to speak some of those out to other people say, hey, by the way, we're just, this is off limits for us. When my mom went into hospice, we thought at first she had just days and then she kind of rebounded and we ended up having about a year left with her. And as we saw the rebound and we knew we were getting some extra time, we did not know how much time we had, but we knew the time, however much it was, was limited. So I asked my mom, I said, mom, not knowing how many conversations we have left, can we avoid talking politics in those conversations? Because even though we agree on a lot of it, you just get worked up. And of all the memories I'm gonna make in the final days with my mama, griping about the Capitol is not one of them. So can we just like maybe like share with me stories of your childhood and your youth and your time before me and you know, let's talk about great memories we've made together. Can we can we like land on those? And my mom agreed. She thought that was a good idea. And on the rare occasion that she would start to slip into the political discourse, I'd say, mom, that's just, that's out of bounds. She'd say, oh, that's right. And we'd come back and, you know, so maybe you, you need to share with some people, this, this is a boundary for me. This is an off limits thing. 
Or maybe when they bring something up, you just say, I, I prefer not to talk about that. Or you can just look at the person and say, that's interesting. How about the Bears? <laughs> How about, you know, whoever your team is, you know, make up a team. Get, get real interested in the next two days so you can change the topic, right? Whatever it is, just switch the topics. And you can say, man, I'd prefer not to. And if they keep pressing the issue, say, I'm not comfortable with this. I don't want to talk this. And I'm going to go over here. Because there are ways to handle that. And it's not always easy and I will give you some hope, too, that sometimes some of those unpleasant conversations, those unpleasant people, eventually we get a chance to speak into it. Some of those dysfunctional things I've dealt with in my family over the years, now years later, I've seen some of them begin asking questions of faith, showing interest in the faith. I've watched some of them surrender to Jesus and walk as people of faith. And I'm hopeful that you can experience the same thing. You know, another thing we witness that Jesus does is he responds instead of reacting. He chooses not to react, but instead to respond. And if you're wondering what the difference is, well, a reaction is often impulsive, while a response is often planned. Now, some of you, this is just your natural way of responding. You are one of those calm people who processes before you speak. Some of you are wired like me. <laughs> and you're just gonna, woo, like whatever happens, it just comes out. And so if that's you, you gotta pause and then choose to calmly plan your thought. Reactions are typically aggressive while responses are typically calm. A reaction is typically defensive while the response is inquisitive. Instead of a hmm, it's a hmm. Reactions are often destructive. They're swinging the ax and chopping it down. You grab it and you just start swinging too and then everything's falling apart at that point. But a response is constructive. Instead of how do we tear this thing down, you're asking how can we build this up? And a reaction is often responding to an, like an attack on you, so you attack back. But attacking back never solves the issue, never gets to a good place. It only makes for more attacks. So instead of doing that, I encourage you, find a way to respond. Just count to five, and while you're counting to five, remind yourself that your worth, your value, is not wrapped up into what this other person says of you or how this conversation goes. And then determine that you will learn their perspective, that you want to be curious. So trade curiosity for what would have been fear. Choose compassion instead of judgment. And then actually listen to them. Search for the common ground and ask questions. Now, don't ask questions like, oh, yeah? Well, who do you think you are? That's not a good question to ask at Thanksgiving. But ask a question maybe like, that's interesting. Well, tell me about some of your life experiences that have led you to that point. Oh, can you tell me more about that? And if you calmly respond with a question, that tends to bring their calm into it as well. And then ask another question, and another question, another question. Because what happens is the more we listen and the more we ask questions, the more we earn the right to speak. But when we just shout back, let me tell you, church, there's been too much shouting from the kingdom of God. And shouting at a culture that already doesn't agree does not earn us the right to be heard. It does not earn us the place to speak. It just gets us labeled and dismissed. But if we will listen and ask and find common ground, we earn the right to speak into the situation. And there is going to come a time for all those people we interact with when eventually the bad day comes their way. Suffering comes barging into their house and they will begin asking questions. They'll begin seeking advice. And what determines whether they choose Instagram or TikTok or YouTube or the news or some other group of people in their world or if they choose you is whether or not you have earned the right to speak into their life. So let's do our best to earn the place to speak into their life. And when we get the opportunity to speak in their life, let's make sure we do our best to speak winsomely about Jesus. Let's speak winsomely about Jesus. Let's speak hope and grace and mercy. Let's not leave truth out of it, but let's make sure we blend that truth with enough compassion and enough care to find the common ground that it will be heard you know, there's a lot of things that people want to debate, they want to argue, and a lot of those, for some reason, come up this time of year. But one of the hardest things for somebody to argue and debate is your story. So when you speak winsomely about the difference Jesus has made in your life, 
the hope you have, the peace you have, even in the midst of some less than peaceful and less than hopeful circumstances, but the hope and peace you have from Jesus, when you share your story, it's really hard for someone to debate that. So, we're gonna be put on trial. It's gonna happen. We're gonna find those conversations. We're gonna have to defend our faith at times. But if we're put on trial, we might as well be eyewitnesses for Jesus, right? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for all that you endured for us. The mock trial, the accusations, and we know that that trial and those accusations led to a crucifixion. What happened in the courtroom of that house when Peter was in the courtyard outside led to brutality. But we know that that cross led to our freedom. And it made the way for an empty grave. And we celebrate that. We thank you for all that you endured for us so that we would not have to endure the pain of hell, but instead could be reunited with you for eternity. Jesus, we thank you for that. And so we ask you, give us the right words to say. Holy Spirit, give us wisdom to know when to be silent and when to speak. Give us the wisdom to know that when we speak, what to speak, how to speak, how to interact with others in a winsome way. Give us the courage and the boldness that when we get it wrong, to say I'm sorry, to ask for a do-over and to generally hear from another person. God, give us the ability to find common ground so that we can see where somebody else is coming from and find some commonality in the story. And God, give us compassion for all of those who are far from you. We thank you. We thank you that that's how you've interacted with us. And God, we desire to be your representatives to all those who are far from you, that when we speak into their lives, we may speak hope that they may see you. And God, for all who are far from you or who might be just one step away, we pray that God, they will come to know you and to surrender to you, to know the hope that we have because of what you have done for us. We pray all this, that you would find the glory in it all.